good morning, Kensington Church. Who's happy to be here this morning? And we are so glad that you're here. If you could just stand and worship with us. We're going to sing a couple songs this morning, just praising our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thank you. 
thankful for the Christ, the King this morning.
So God, we thank you for just bringing us here, bringing us safely here. And Lord, we just ask you to touch our hearts. turn to your neighbor and I said neighbor I'm, turn to each other and and just ask each other what is the best thing or the fav your your favorite thing to do uh, on the lake all right Welcome back to Lessons on the Lake. Today's lesson is going to be about lake safety, but before we do that, today's video is brought to you by the Move Out Network. I don't really know what the Move Out Network is for. Moving out of your neighborhood, moving out on the lake, let's talk about lake safety. Today's video, we're going to go over recapsizing your kayak after it's flipped over. Very dangerous and it's important skill to know. So first step, ca capsize your kayak. Wait a second. Wait. Hey guys, he's gonna come back up, right? Hey, 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 here, somebody hold this. I think he needs a hand. Dude! I thought you've done that before. I thought you've done that. You said this would be easy. That was not easy. Are you okay? I was terrified. <laughs> Okay, so maybe lesson one is wear your life jacket. We'll start there. So for anybody going out on their boat today, take your life jackets along. Uh, good morning. My name is Jenny. I'm on the team here at Kensington, Birmingham. We're so happy to have you here with us, uh, whether you're here in person or maybe watching online from your boat. That is also a possibility. Um, but we're really glad that you joined us today. Um, I feel like I have to just take something that Tyler said and make sure we write it with everybody. So uh, he said that the video this morning was brought to us by the Move Out Network and that he had no idea uh, what that was. So I want to make sure we all all know about the Move Out Network. Uh, this is one of Kensington's um, initiatives. We have almost 50 teams made up of volunteers who are working with local organizations, making an impact, loving our neighbors, and sending people out into our local community to have an impact and to help care for people in real, tangible ways. And every Monday, we feature one of our Move Out teams on Kensington's social media platforms. Um, and our hope is that at some point, if, if you feel that nudge that, uh, God would use a strength or a passion of yours to make a difference in our local community. You can always uh, check out the Move Out page on the website, or you can scan. I think there maybe is a QR code somewhere. Well, it's okay. That website is correct, but you can always check out the Move Out Network to see what is happening in our local community and how you might also be a part of making a difference. There are other ways uh, to also get better connected here around Kensington. One of those is by sharing a meal with us. We like to do that a lot. So this coming Wednesday, we've got a barbecue. This is an open invite, a casual environment, a great way to meet and connect with other people. We would love for you to join us. Uh, you just let us know you're coming with the RSVP there. And we're also sharing a meal today, actually. So every six weeks or so, uh, we host something called a welcome lunch. So if you are new around Kensington, Kensington, or maybe you've been coming for a little while, maybe watching online, and 
maybe just would like to meet some of our staff, ask a few questions, learn a few things. Uh, we host a welcome lunch about every six weeks right after the service, just down the hallway toward K Kids. So if that is you today, if you're you know new or around Kensington or just looking for a clear way to take a next step, please just hang around right after the service. We would love to meet you and get to talk with you there. I will also say, if you have any general questions about Kensington, whenever you're ready, you can always stop by the hub, which is under the tent after the service. Today, my friends Greta and Emily are there. I know they would love to meet you, answer any questions that you have and get better connected. All right, as Tyler did mention in that video, we are in our summer sermon series called Lessons from the Lake, where we are exploring teachings of Jesus that he happened to do in or near or around the water. So we're going to take a minute and just pray, and then we will jump in together. Uh, Lord, we thank you for a beautiful morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to gather as your church community. Um, we know that you are alive and speaking. And so I pray that you would open our hearts this morning to hear from you, that whatever it is you want us to walk away with today, Lord, that you would soften our hearts to hear from you, Jesus. We love you and we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. So uh, I'm going to give my weekly update. If you uh, don't know, I have a boot on my leg and uh, uh, I don't have to get surgery. Can, so can anyone want to be excited for that? Yes. I'm fearful by saying that they'll actually tell me that tomorrow I do. Uh, but anyways, if we haven't met, my name is Justin. I'm, uh, I'm actually more mobile today. I've been sitting on a chair these last couple weeks. I was telling our video team, I'm like, I'm back. And I'm ready to share some things. I'm excited. Uh, so we're in this series called Lessons from the Lake. And, and uh, I want to ask this quick, quick poll of hands. Uh, lake activities. Who loves uh, going on a boat? Who's like, I love just being on the boat? Okay. Now, where are my lake sports activities uh, wake surfing, wakeboarding, anybody else? You're like, no, I like not hurting in the morning. Okay, great. Um, I, I was just uh, driving our kids uh, yesterday on a boat uh, with the tubing. I, I definitely gave one of my children a, uh, a, a bruise as they landed on each other. You know, I don't know if you've seen those videos, you launch them. Like, I love launching my kids in the water. It's great. Uh, it's called love. And, um, and then how many of you just want to be near water? Where am I just like, put me near water, I'm a happy person. Okay, I love all of it. I love all of it. So we're, we've been talking about this, these different moments of Jesus talking around a lake, a specific lake. And, and so I'm going to dive into that in just a moment. But before I do, I'm going to take a moment and receive our offering. This is something we do every single week. It's an opportunity, an invitation to you. Uh, if you call Kensington home, if you've been a part of our community, we're inviting you to join us and partner with us in generosity. If today is your first day, you can let this moment pass. It is, it is not a moment for you. You just enjoy. We're so glad that you're here. But if you've been in this journey or on this journey with us, uh, our generosity is the fuel for impact. It's the fuel for having an impact both here locally and globally, some of the Move Out networks to be able to partner with them, and also some of the things around our community all around the world. And many of you know we are partnered with uh, a number of global partners. One of our friends, uh, Brenda, just came back from our partner in Kenya, which is amazing. We have partnerships in Israel, in Palestine. We have partnerships in Nepal. Like There are just these incredible opportunities that we get to have an impact beyond just our local community. And so when your generosity partners with us, we are so grateful for that. And, uh, and I invite you to do that. Our ushers are going to come forward. There's a number of ways to give on the screen and also uh, through the pouches that are being passed. All right. So have you ever had a moment that you were a part of that you're like, I am so glad somebody else was there to witness it? Right? It's like when I, I've been playing basketball with my son, and uh, we'll throw out these miracle shots. So for like the other day, I probably tried to do a behind-the-back shot 20 times, right, to be able to impress him. And finally, I landed one. I'm like, you saw that, right? He's like, no. <laughs> right? It's like, ah, oh, I missed it. But you have these moments like, if somebody else wasn't there, nobody would believe me. Jenny and I have this joke that she is cursed when it comes to technology. And anytime she has some piece of technology, she's like, Justin, it doesn't work. She hands it into my hands, and all of a sudden, it works completely. Doesn't matter if it's a remote, it's a phone, it's an iPad. Like, there is, and she keeps asking, like, what is it that you do? And I'm like, I don't think it's me. Um, I love you. But there was this one moment that I... Uh, I was just talking about with family that happened years and years ago. We were in Malaysia with family, and we were on this trip, kind of this family trip, and uh, we were going to see my cousins and my aunt and uncle. And so we were in Malaysia, and we took a vehicle uh, from the main city, Kuala Lumpur, up into the mountains. And so we're driving into the mountains. 
and we've been, we've been going for a couple hours on this drive. We're out in the middle of nowhere. It's just up and down, up and down. And all of a sudden, I don't know if you've ever had one of these moments, the car starts to sputter. And you're like, oh, no. And all of a sudden, there's like three cars because how big our family and our cousins all together. So our car starts to sputter, and we end up pulling off to the side of the road, and we can't turn it back on. And we're trying, we're, the engine seems like it's flooding. There's just chaos happening. And for a half hour, we're trying everything we can. Now, I'm an engineer, but I know nothing about, uh, about technology when it comes to vehicles. I'm not an automotive tech. I just know how to like do a CAD drawing. It's, it's not practical out in the real world. And so I'm sitting there with my, with my brother-in-law, my dad, and my uncle, and we are frustrated. And my brother and I look at each other like, hey, what if we just pray for the vehicle? And my uncle, who's like this savvy businessman, is like, no, no, that is not going to work. And so my brother and I was like, let's just try it. And we put our hand on the hood and we went for it. We gave the most honest prayer we've ever given in desperation. And then we look up at my uncle and we're like, turn it, turn the key. And all of a sudden he turns the key and it turned on. I was like, amen, Jesus, you are real. Right? Like, I was like, I don't know what happened. And for the entire trip, no other problem ever. Gone. So I'm like, this is a miracle. I've experienced a miracle in my life. And so a couple years ago, I'm driving my high, high quality, high class 2004 Pontiac Vibe. And um, we're driving it, and I, I'm selling it because it's not so high quality anymore. And, um, and as I'm driving to uh, the dealership to sell it, my engine starts to sputter. And I'm like, okay. I know what to do. <laughs> I know what to do. And so I pull over as it starts to sputter, and I pray. And then all of a sudden, the car turns back on, and I start driving. I'm like, Jesus, you're real. You are real. And then it sputters again, and it dies. And I'm like, okay, I just need to pray longer. <laughs> so I pray, and then the most incredible thing happened. Nothing. And I walked a mile and a half in the rain to the dealership and had to tow my vehicle. So I don't know why one time it worked and one time it didn't. And you're like, how does this apply today? It doesn't. No, I'm just joking. It does. We're talking about this moment in Jesus' life where there's this moment of spiritual warfare, if you will. There's this moment where Jesus interacts with a man. And, it, and it's one of those things when you talk about spiritual warfare, people are like, what do I do with that? right? How do I put God into a box? And how do I know the answer if I pray answers this way? Or if I pray for this situation to happen, it's going to happen. Like, why does God answer this way and that way and not always the same? The answer is, I have no idea. I've seen incredible moments of darkness. I've seen incredible moments of evil where things have treacherous have happened. I've seen incredible moments of God moving in miraculous ways and providing healing and transformation. I've been able to witness those personally, be a part of those, and I have no idea why he answers one way sometimes and one way another. And I actually don't think that's the point. What I actually think in this story that I want to share is that there's something about the spiritual world, not just the physical world, but the spiritual world, our soul, that meets more than just our eye, meets more than just our everyday. And, and there's something that Jesus teaches us in it that sometimes maybe we're distracted by the miraculous instead of actually noticing what he wants, what he wants to teach us, what he wants to take notice of. See, as our culture, I remember reading this article out of the New York Times where uh, it was a writer talking about this spiritual enlightenment journey they were going on. They were so exhausted by life, they were so distraught by their job that they were going to document in a spiritual enlightenment trip because they wanted to figure out life. I, I, I've noticed over the years that people talking about spiritual retreats or different, different types of things because they know that there's something deeper than just the physical world. And they're just trying to grasp hold of what do I do with the chaos that I find myself in? Even uh, in 2023, Pew Research uh, surveyed a number of people and it said this, 83% of adults in the U.S. believe that people have a soul or a spirit in addition to the physical body. So the majority of our culture believes that there's something beyond just the physical. 81% say they, they believe something spiritual beyond the natural world, even if we can't see it. And 30% of Americans will even say they personally encountered a spirit or unseen force. And many times when people ask, like, where's your faith as a culture, more and more people are saying, I'm spiritual but not religious. And maybe that connects with you. 
Maybe that's something that you have felt. You've been on a journey of spirituality, but you're, you're not quite sure about the religious structures or, you know, there's been experiences that you carry with you, and so you kind of keep them at arm's length. But what we know about Jesus is that in the four Gospels, in the four narratives that follow his life, he interacted with demons or spiritual warfare 55 times directly. So I have this thought for today. Imagine as we walk through this scripture, I want you to imagine if life was like your car dashboard and you're driving through life, and you're just going from point A to point B, and you have a choice. There are moments when something comes up on the dashboard, a warning light, or, or maybe there's a blind spot, somebody letting you know, like on the side of your vehicle, not my 2004 Pontiac Vibe, but other vehicles, they have that little light that pops up to let you know, like there's something in the blind spot, and you have a choice every single time. You can either engage that, that, that kind of notification or you can ignore it and keep going. But I believe today, when we look at the scripture of Jesus, when he comes face to face with a demon-possessed man, that he wants us to take notice of what happens. He might not be subscribing a way to navigate spiritual warfare, but he might be providing us something to notice about truth, about who he is and who we are. And maybe as we lean into this story, Jesus can use a very unexpected moment, even for his followers, to have an unexpected impact on our lives. And I believe that's part of the heart of this story that we take notice. So I'm going to start, as we've been on this, this journey on the lake, I'm going to show you a picture from my time when I took a group of, uh, of men to Israel and we walked through Israel and Palestine in different regions. This is on the Sea of Galilee. And this is on what is called the city of Tiberias. And it's on what is known as the Jewish side of the lake. But on the other side, so sometimes scripture talks about a couple different things on the Sea of Galilee. You can see in the shadows, just at the sunrise, there's these mountains off in the distance. And maybe you've heard them discussed in politics, but those mountains, that region over there is called the Golan Heights. In the scripture, it's called Decapolis. It was known as these seven cities that sat on the other side of the lake, the non-Jewish side of the lake. Even writers would just call it the other side. They wouldn't even label it because it was considered unclean or less than. And so this other side of the lake is where the story begins to take place. And it's really interesting when we look at that picture and we see that image. One of the things that is cool at nighttime is you can actually see uh, when, when it's dark enough, you can see the seven cities that are all lit up on the tops of, of the different mountains and uh, on the Golan Heights. It's really an incredible sight to see. And so this is the region that is being talked about in chapter 5 of the book of, of Mark. They, Jesus and the disciples, went across the lake to the region of Gerasenes. That's that region, right? It's got a couple different names. And when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came to him from the tombs to meet him. And it was later described that no one could subdue him. No one could subdue him. So there's a couple things that happens in this story. I'm going to summarize it because it's a large amount of scripture. But when Jesus was far off, this man came running to Jesus and knelt at his feet and cried out to him, begged him to take away the demon-possessed experience that he was having. And Jesus responded, simply said, come out of, of the man, you unclean spirit. And what happens begins this dialogue of where the spirit would go. And the, and the spirit was begging, don't send us away. And the spirit was sent into a herd of pigs. Maybe you've heard this story. And the pigs end up going into the water. You know, what's very interesting about this moment is that when this happened, you'd think the community around would be like, oh my goodness, Jesus just healed this man. Like, let's go praise him. Instead, they were fearful of him. They're like, what is this man doing? Who is this Jesus and why is he here in this way? And so they didn't praise Jesus. They actually begged him to leave. Very, take notice of this. The very people in this moment begged Jesus to leave. And then Jesus, as he was getting into the moat, the man who had, who had been demon-possessed begged to go with Jesus. But Jesus did not let him. And said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for them. And notice this, and all the people were amazed. There's a lot to talk about in this. I want to just point out three truths for us today. Three truths that we can apply today. And the first one is this. There is spiritual resistance. Sometimes we kind of go through life and we ignore some of the things that are happening around us because we don't want to. But I believe this wholeheartedly with my soul. There is spiritual resistance. 
Now, this man experienced multiple layers of resistance in his life. He experienced, and we'll, we'll dive a little bit more into him, but I love how Ephesians 6, 12 says this. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Paul, the writer of this, is calling out, like, there is a spiritual battle going on, and it's not just a physical battle. And I think it's so important that we understand when it comes to spiritual resistance that it's happening all the time. It's happening in different ways. For each of us, it might be a little bit different. Like our battle isn't thinking that the person who has a different political view than us is our enemy and treating them as such. Or a person who has a different ideology or philosophy is, a, is an enemy. Or the person who cut me off in front of Costco and didn't look me in the eye on Saturday, which was my mistake. They're not the enemy, right? Or the person who rear-ended me, maybe, a couple years ago from Ohio, and they lied to the cops who they were friends with. They're not my enemy. My spouse, when we're in a difficult conversation, is not my enemy. My coworker that I don't understand is not my enemy. The person who is other than me is not my enemy. See, there's this idea that happens in our lives where we start to hold people and we kind of buy into the lies of spiritual resistance that if somebody is different, other, or not like me, they are to be pushed aside and seen as devalued. That's what happens with this man. See, what is known as the devil or described in scripture as the deceiver, the deceiver is often known for being in opposition to force, to, to speak to apathy and lies. It lies about us, it lies, it lies about God, and it lies about who we are. That's the spiritual resistance that's happening. And this man, the reason why he was where he was is because he was seen as other. So not only was he on the other side of the lake because he wasn't fully Jewish, he was a, he was a half-breed, Right? The reason why he was on the other side of the lake is because he was less than. Now, the reason why he wasn't in the city area and he was in the caves is because he was less than. The reason why people didn't want to go near him is because he was less than. He was pushed to the margin of margins of margins. And what happens in our world is sometimes we allow the spiritual resistance in life to push people to the margins. Resistance does something. I believe resistance is a great revealer in life. Resistance in all forms. It reveals what our hope is. When we come face to face with a lie that kind of starts festering in our mind, where do we place our hope? Where do we place our fear? Where do we place our trust? Resistance is happening. And sometimes what happens in the middle of resistance, it reveals that what we've been trusting in, our systems, our beliefs about ourselves, our accolades at our work, they are not holding up in the face of resistance. They do not satisfy. Ultimately, I believe, resistance will reveal our character. This man experienced resistance from his people, but also we know as he came out and begged Jesus for help, he, resist, he experienced resistance internally as well. Have you ever had a moment where you knew, like you knew you were about to do something that was going to hurt a sibling, a friend, a spouse, a neighbor, or a coworker, and you did it anyways? Like you had that narrative in your mind? You don't want to act like you can talk to yourself, but you, you're having a conversation. You're like, I know I shouldn't. I know I shouldn't say it this way. I know I shouldn't act this way. And yet you feel just this tension inside of us. But the beautiful part in this story is while that resistance happens and we're kind of trying to figure our way through it, the spiritual resistance in this moment reveals something about Jesus. And I want us to take notice. So while this is happening for the man and the man runs up to Jesus, remember, this guy has been pushed to the margins. Jesus does a few things that I want us to take notice. He doesn't run from the man like everybody else. He doesn't disregard his burdens or his pain. He doesn't shame him and blame him for the decisions that allowed him to be in the situation he's in. Jesus does not push him to the side. Jesus sees him, meets him in that moment, and gives him hope. He gives him hope. So while there is a truth that there is spiritual resistance, there is an even more powerful truth that there is hope. There is hope. I love what 1 John 3, 4 says. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. The reason why Jesus appeared 
was to destroy the deceit, the lies, the burdens that we carry, the things that we bring on to ourselves. And I love how even the apostle Peter described Jesus not just as hope, but as living hope. Saying, while the deceit is, leads to death, Jesus leads to life. So I want you to think about this. When resistance strikes, the living hope reveals something. Jesus reveals something. And here are a few things to think about. When light moves in, even in this space, when light comes into this room, darkness is pushed to the corners. It happens every time, every time light shows up. In the same way, when we hear truth in our lives, some of the lies we've been believed, believing gets pushed to the corners and they begin to lose power. When light moves in, our resolve, our belief, our courage increases. When light moves in, our humility increases and our pride lessens. When light moves in, the power of transformation begins to take hold and the power of darkness that has been keeping us in shackles begins to lose their ability. One of my favorite writers uh, in the New Testament is a, is a man known as James. And he's very interesting because James was the brother of Jesus. But you, what happened in James's life is he would end up going on to be uh, one of the key spiritual leaders in, uh, of Israel, in Israel, in, uh, specifically in Jerusalem. And, and one of the things that happened as he led out his faith following his brother, he didn't do that at the beginning. Something happened. He experienced the, the resurrection of his brother and is like, there is something different here. In one of his writings, he says this, you believe that there is one God good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. That's what happened in the story with Jesus as he came face to face with the demon-possessed man. Is the demons actually shuddered as Jesus came close. They lost power. They lost strength. Their deceit began to fall short. They were pushed to the side and margined, and healing was allowed to take place. So I was thinking about this. When darkness moves in, what can kind of take hold? And I can go back to a moment early in Jenny and I's relationship in our marriage, and I remember a moment where I went into hiding, because that's what happens when darkness comes into my life. I go into hiding, because I don't want to be seen. I don't want to admit my fault. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna apologize. Like, I wanna go into hiding, and I just want to grit through the moment. And I hope by being in hiding, I'm going to be able to push past this certain season we're in, and then we're going to be able to be good. And I remember every single interaction I had with Jenny in, in a certain season, I felt like I was holding something back. I was only partially there. Because I, I had lied to her. And I had been living in that lie. And in that lie, I've been, I've been kind of trying to be like, oh, it's not a big deal, or it doesn't matter. But what's happening is in my soul, there was a festering deep inside of me. There was a, a festering of like, I know we're not connected right now because I am in hiding. And what I was allowing is darkness to move in. I was allowing darkness and the lies of, of what, what I was being deceived to think of. I could just hide my way through our situation. And I can go back to the moment in our living room where we sat down on the couch and after many, many months of debating, like, should I really share what's going on in my mind? Should I really share what's going on in my heart? Should I share what I've been dealing with, the lies I've been believing and, and the way I've been feeling? And I finally felt that moment of just a little nudge of courage, a little light that broke through. I remember the conversation. I'll, I'll never forget it. All the fears I had, all the worries I had, all the lies that I believed that I had allowed to basically torment me for months and months, the grace and conversation and the honesty in our relationship and the moment that we came together in that moment brought so much healing to our situation. Light began to move in where darkness had taken hold. And I go back to that, and because of that moment, I, I, in our relationship, I, I don't want to hide. I don't want to hide parts of my struggles. I don't want to hide parts of who I am and what I'm trying to figure out. I don't want to hide, and I, and I want to be open to the feedback that is required for us to grow together. And I felt like in that moment, it was like this battle that I felt, or what's often depicted in, in TV shows as like good angel and bad angel that was kind of in my mind. And I felt like light began to move in. And it's this reminder that Paul shares with us in 2 Corinthians. He says this, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Isn't it interesting that we have 
Jesus, who has the ability to overcome death, who offers us hope, a living hope, and yet we still try to do it all on our own? Like, I think about that, I'm like, how prideful am I that I think I have it all together? How much have I tried to grit my teeth through situations and I've allowed darkness to move in when the weapons that I'm using fall short every time? Like, I know this. I know this every single time. But yet, when we step into these moments and we realize that God's power has the power to demolish the strongholds, demolish right now your fears that you've been holding on to, demolish the lies that have been speaking into your identity, demolish the strongholds, just thinking, if I achieve enough, I will feel worthy. If my bank account is at the right spot, if people see me in a certain way, if I get enough praise, then I will feel worthy. Those strongholds are all lies. And they're the way the devil uses deceit to kind of bind us to it. But in the middle of the spiritual resistance that happens, a living hope is able to take hold and to call us in a different direction. That's what happens in the man's life. I don't know why Jesus healed this man and not the other. I don't know in other stories where we hear it's like Jesus heals this person and that, but not that person. But what I do know is regardless of situation, in the middle of spiritual resistance, there is living hope. And it's not hope that I have it all together. It's the hope that Jesus is able to do what he calls the divine power to demolish strongholds. So if there is spiritual resistance and there is hope, the last thing is there is a calling. There is a calling. One of the things I think about when it comes to faith, when, I think, when it comes to, to Christianity and I have conversations with people, it's like, what is so attractive about Christianity? It's like, well, everybody who attends church is perfect and has their life together. <laughs> nope. Right? Like the most beautiful thing about Jesus isn't that you are perfect because you're not. I don't know if you know that. Your spouse will tell you. Your kids will tell you. They'll let you know. You could have the greatest day of serving your children and they will let you know you did not let them have their fourth dessert and you are not cool. Like here's the reality. The most powerful the most attractive thing about Jesus is that imperfect people who are jacked up are invited to experience perfect love. And when you make a mistake, you're invited again. And when, when you experience that love, you don't go tell people, hey, I'm now perfect now. It's like, no, I've experienced a love that is different than this world. It demolished the stronghold of identity in my life. It demolished the shame that I've been carrying. It's demolished the, the guilt that I carry with me. It's demolished the thought that I thought if I just had the right job, the right title, the right thing, I would be enough. It demolished that because all of that falls short. It demolishes the thought that if my life goes perfectly, then I will be able to talk about Jesus. Instead, the most beautiful thing about Jesus is that Jesus meets us with his perfect love and his incredible mercy in our imperfection over and over and over and over and over again. That's the most beautiful thing. He takes the person who's the most marginalized and pushed off to the side and invites them closer and doesn't run from them but goes to them. See, when you and I realize we have been called, and we're wondering, what have we been called to? I believe this. We've been called to action. We've been called to courage. We've been called to community. We've been called to move into spaces with the love of Jesus. We've been called to use our gifts as business leaders, teachers, parents, brothers, sisters, neighbors, doctors, whatever role you play in this world, your role is not that title. Your role is to usher in the love of Jesus over and over again because that's the only thing that transcends. It's the only thing that transcends. Like, notice what Jesus called this man to. When he entered the boat, when Jesus entered the boat, he who had been possessed with demons prayed to him that he might be with him. And he, he asked, he's like, Jesus, would you let me come with you? Right? He begged him. But Jesus did not let him. He said, go home. Go home to your own people. And I want you to do these things. I want you to tell what the Lord has done for you. I want you to tell how he's healed you. I want you to tell how he gave you grace. I want you to tell how much mercy he had on you. I want you to tell that he offered you forgiveness. I want you to tell these things that just happened to you. And so this man, when he was begging to leave with Jesus, and think about it. 
He's being sent home to the people who pushed him to the side, the people who marginalized him, maybe the people who hurt him, the family structures that didn't set him up for success. He's, he's sent to these places, and he's told, go to those places and tell what Jesus has done. So this man went away, and he began to tell people in the entire region of the Decapolis about all that Jesus has done. And you want to know what happened to people who saw it, who heard his story, who experienced the change and transformation in his life? They were amazed because they knew. He couldn't do this on his own. He didn't have the ability to do all of this. They knew that Jesus intersected his life with something different, and it was a story worth telling. Great things are proclaimed when we talk about the mercy of Jesus. Great things happen when we talk about the grace of Jesus and the love of Jesus. Great things when we talk about how the lies and the deceit in our life have been broken. I think about this in a modern day experience right now. There's a, a group that we partner with in Nepal called Our Daughters International. And it's an incredible community um, that, that helps rescue women who have been trafficked by their very own communities, their very own family for dollars. And our relationship with our daughters is helping rescue these women, providing them a safe place of healing and restoration, offering them uh, ways to, to learn how to add value through different work talents, different abilities. Like some of our friends have, have been sent over there to teach about different business opportunities, how to run your own small business, how to, how to navigate culture and, and different things. And then these women actually go back to the very similar communities that they just got sold for and bring the hope of Jesus. These women become the church planners in communities. They become the business leaders. They become the bankers. And it's been this amazing experience. And because this is happening, there are men in the community. We started this curriculum about six years ago out of our men's retreat called Man Up Defenders. And a group of men in these different towns have now stood up and said, we're going to help stop trafficking from happening because of what ha transformation has happened in these women's lives. Like these women inspired communities to stop what is happening and begin to shift the future of lives. They're the ones on the front lines rescuing other women. They're the ones providing safe spaces. And so what happens is the reason why they gather, the reason why they experience just this, this moment of, of connection and relationship and hope is so that they could experience healing. But they don't just stay there. They go. They go back to the very same places where it's hurt them and offer healing and hope. And I think sometimes in the church, we can get sucked into this belief is all I need to do is I just need to hear more about Jesus. And when I hear just enough about Jesus, maybe then I'll think about saying something or posting something on social media. Maybe. Maybe then I'll, I'll, I'll talk to somebody about it. But I, I, oh, I'm going to wait until I feel completely comfortable. And I don't think that's the story. I think the moment is when Jesus meets us in the middle of our chaos, whatever that chaos is, on Monday, on Tuesday, in our offices, in our neighbor, neighborhoods, we go. We gather on Sunday. We encourage each other on Sunday. We remind each other of the hope and the mercy of Jesus. And then we go. And we invite people to experience the very same hope we've experienced. We don't say our lives are perfect. We just say, I met perfect love. I met perfect love and it's transforming me. And I'm still figuring it out. But I take it into my office. I take it into my neighborhood. I take it into my family. And I step into my calling. So I want to give you just four quick thoughts on what it means to step into your calling. Where are you called to? Where are you being called to right now? What community what person? Maybe what person you've held at a distance? What, what, what place are you being invited to step in with the perfect love of Jesus in your imperfect life? The first thing that I would say it starts with is prayer. I love what this Catholic priest from the 1500s said, St. Francis de, La Sa de Sales. He says, every one of us needs a half hour of prayer a day. Don't be worried by this. But he says this, and this was the perspective that challenged me. Except when we're busy, then we need an hour. How often in the middle of our chaos, we're like, Jesus, give me a moment and then I'll be good. But I, I, but I only got two minutes to give you. No, Jesus is saying, will you meet me? Will you meet me in my chaos and, and move with me in the places that I direct you? 
The second is awareness. We need to be aware that there is going to be opposition. Let's not be, let's not be tricked into thinking if we just have our life perfectly together, everything's going to go smooth sailing. That's a lie. It hasn't happened for me. I know it hasn't happened for you. You've done the right things at the right time in the right way. And still, sometimes things don't go the way you hoped or desired. There's going to be opposition. But it's in that opposition that you are reminded of what is true. It's in the resistance that God reveals his grace and his truth and his love. It's in the resistance that he speaks to the lies that you believed. It's in the resistance that he reveals his character and he wants us to take notice. The third might be the most difficult, obedience. To actually be willing to follow Jesus no matter what. There's a lot of moments where we hear Jesus maybe speak something to us, give us vision, nudge our hearts, speak to our souls. And if you're like me at times, you're like, maybe next time. Maybe next time. I'm not ready yet. See, part of the thing about prayer and awareness is to call us into obedience. That's what I felt in the conversation I had with my wife. I was, a, I was prayerful about it, I was aware of it, but I wasn't obeying. And in that moment of having that conversation, of stepping into that, that small, courageous step, I experienced healing in a way that I'll hold on to for the rest of my life. Like our conversation that we could be gut level honest about our struggles gave me strength to be gut level honest two days ago, five days ago, three weeks ago, so that we can continue to grow in who we are and who we are becoming. It's the willingness, the obedience to follow Jesus no matter what, even when it's difficult. And the last, it's prayer. Because guess what? I, when I start with prayer, it's a good day. But when I forget to pray as I'm going through it, I start to lose courage. I start to lose strength. I start to lose hope. And I just believe when we come back to prayer, God moves in the most inspiring ways. I want to close with this thought. The most inspiring thing about this story to me is not Jesus healed the demon-possessed man. Be very honest. Don't know why he did it this time versus another time. The most inspiring thing to me is actually that the people asked Jesus to leave and Jesus said yes, but he sent the one demon-possessed healed man back. And it was that person that amazed everybody with the story of Jesus' healing. The most amazing thing to me is the demon-possessed man was willing to go back to the very people who othered him, who marginalized him, who pushed him to the side, and was willing to courageously tell his story to the people who didn't treat him well. That's the most encouraging thing to me. It's the most inspiring thing. It's the thing I can't stop thinking about when I read this story, because I want it to be a lot easier than that. I want to get on the boat with Jesus and run away from my life, rather than run into the places where Jesus tells me. But this man was willing to do it. He was willing to step into the calling that Jesus had for him. And I think that is the invitation for all of us. Is that no matter where we are, no matter where we've been, that all we are called to do is to speak of the transformation that happens in the person of Jesus. And if we're not feeling transformed right now, to be honest about that. If we're feeling burdened right now, to be honest about that. And to know Jesus still has mercy. And Jesus is willing to meet us in that because Jesus is the living hope. And when Jesus, as the living hope, meets us, everything changes. I remember this one moment I, I watched of a young man that I was mentoring in college. When I met him, he couldn't even look me in the eyes because of how much shame and guilt that he had in his life for his decisions. He, like, he just told me part of it with his eyes down of just how embarrassed he was about life. And I remember as he started to allow Jesus to meet him in his embarrassment, in his shame, in his hurt, that his eyes over the next three weeks began to lift. The story he would tell to people, the story that he would tell to strangers, the story that he would invite people into is one of the most powerful stories, but only he could tell it because only he was transformed. Only he went from a person who was filled with shame and guilt and felt all the way in the margins to somebody who was saying, I may have felt that way, but I was met with the mercy of Jesus and that is all I have and it's all I have to offer you. May that be the type of story we tell as a community. Jesus, we are so grateful 
that you meet us with mercy, that you meet us with grace, that you speak truth to lies, that you allow us to take notice of how you invite us to experience you over and over and over again. Jesus, we are grateful that we don't have to have life all figured out, that we don't have to be perfect people, but as imperfect people, you meet us and you invite us into a journey of following you. Would you give us the courage to step into the calling? Would you give us the courage to respond in the moments of darkness? Would you give us the courage to allow light to break through the darkness and provide hope, a living hope that only you can provide? Lord, we lift up these words this day to you. We lift up our community to you. And we ask that in the middle of the resistance, we experience your grace again and again and again. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to step into a time of worship here as we wrap up our, our time here together today. And uh, the songs that we're about to sing may be extremely familiar, especially if you've been around Kensington for a while. But even if this is your first time hearing them, I would really love to encourage you to channel your prayer through what we're about to sing together. For me, at least, I know both on stage and or in the seats. Sometimes I can't. Sometimes I can't get the words myself, but to sing it, to use it as a prayer, as a call out, as a cry out, as a reach out to God, has only ever helped me along in life. So let's stand together and let's sing this. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. You hid in glory and creation, now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name.
So we 
Reminder, why don't we go with this one right here? Colton, you're taller than me. Uh, it's a great reminder that in the middle of our chaos, in the middle of resistance, like sometimes for me, music is that anchor point. It's that anchor point to go, I'm gonna sing these songs, it's my prayer. I love how Colleen led us in that, it's our prayer of what God might do. So when we're singing those songs, may they be an encouragement to you. So as you go out into your day, as you experience the chaos of the world, you have these anchor points to remind you of who you are and whose you are. You are the son and daughter of a God who has incredible mercy, incredible grace, who offers hope in the middle of chaos. He says, he's not done with us, but he says, I have more for you. That is an, an invitation that the world does not have. The world just offers like, if you achieve enough, if you do enough, if you buy into these lives, then you'll be considered good enough. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. I've been victorious so that no matter what, I see you, I love you, and I'm gonna move towards you. So may that be what gives us courage in the middle of the chaos. May that be our living hope as we go forward today, amen? All right, so glad that you are here today. By the way, I would just say this, if you can hang out for like 20, 30 minutes for a welcome lunch, if you're newer, would love for you to go out these doors to the right. Otherwise, we will see you back here next week. Have a great week.